Well, good evening. How are you doing? Uh, it's just gone uh, 9 p.m. UK time. Uh, I'm here in Port Stewart in Northern Ireland, staying at home like nearly everybody else. And um, each weekday evening at this time, I'm reading a chapter from my book, Paperboy, which I hope will um, give you a bit, of, a bit of nostalgia and a bit of crack and a bit of a Belfast bedtime story every every uh, night at this time. So uh, this evening, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone along. And uh, this evening, I'm going to continue the story. And we're up now to chapter nine. And chapter nine of Paper Boy is a chapter entitled Wider Horizons. I was not well traveled, so I wasn't. I had left Ireland only once in my life on a primary school trip to Ayr in Scotland. But the experience was marred when the teacher slapped me around the head because I had been ungrateful enough to fall asleep in the cinema during the On the Buses movie. So I got homesick and hated that teacher ever after. However, as I thumbed through my Belfast telegraphs, night unexpected information within those pages that fueled a new desire to see the wider world. It was the holiday section that always caught my eye. There were ads for a week in a caravan in Donegal, where my father had climbed up on the roof of the toilets to rescue my kite. But we had stopped going to Donegal when the trouble started in to bring a united Ireland. Donegal always confused me because everyone said it was down south. But on the map in my geography class, it was further north than most of the north. Nobody seemed to notice. Maybe compasses were different in Donegal. Then I discovered at the back of the TV Times, there were adverts for trips to more far away places like the Isle of Man and Blackpool and the Costa Brava, where Judith Chalmers got a tan every week on UTV. The more I devoured the holiday ads in the newspaper my profession brought me into contact with, the more I longed to travel to these long haul destinations. I had always enjoyed the caravan and the candy floss in Malaile, but I began to dream of wider horizons, so I did. I wanted to go to Sweden, where Abba lived on an island with a piano and snow and fur coats. I wanted to visit London, where they and wimpy burgers, and where the royal. I longed to go to Italy to see where a volcano in my history book had buried everyone, even the dogs. I wanted to visit China where they had a huge wall you could see from outer space. Apparently, it was bigger than the peace wall between the Falls and the Shankle, and they didn't even have Protestants and Catholics in China. As I dutifully delivered my daily papers on automatic pilot, I daydreamed of flying on a jet plane to America, where they made big cars and movies and Osmonds. I would also imagine myself on a trek across Australia where Skippy the Bush Kangaroo would be there to save me if I ever fell down a disused mine shaft. Of course, I also had dreams of travelling to the planet Vulcan, but there were never any package deals to that particular destination in the Belfast Telegraph. Unfortunately, I knew rightly that not even the pool resources of my father's overtime earnings at the foundry, my mother's income from extra sewing for swanky ladies up the Lisburn Road, my big brother's poker winnings from the garden shed, and several bootfuls of my Christmas, Christmas tips would ever be enough to finance any trips to these exotic destinations. I envied boys in my at Belfast Royal Academy, like Timothy Longsley, who was whose parents said all their ings and were always going holidaying to their cottage in effing France. But then fate intervened in my favour. 
those times I would unexpectedly bump into Sharon Burgess in Woodville Park in her hot pants. For all of a sudden, it seemed that everybody wanted to send us poor kids from the Shanko on trips away from the Troubles. It was amazing. The nice people with all the money for trips must have heard that the Westy Disco was full of poor wee potential pentrobombers who needed taken away from war-torn Belfast. And so suddenly and unexpectedly, exciting new opportunities for us. And as we were wee deprived kids from West Belfast, the trips were absolutely free. We didn't have to pay a single penny, which meant more spending money for buying sweetie mice to eat on the journey. Yes, these trips were as free as a Captain Scarlet badge in a box of sugar puffs. The only problem for me was recruiting a sufficiently trustworthy substitute paperboy to stand in for me while I was away. But I could be quite resourceful when I needed to. So let's say hello to uh, who's uh, joining me this evening. Hello, oh, there's a few Macaulays from around the world. Hi, Marty Macaulay and Joan Macaulay. Hello, Susan Wilgar, lovely to have you along. And um, the lovely Leslie's with me. Hello, Nigel McComb. Hi, Michelle Rose. Um, hi, John McGovern from Yamba, Australia. Yes, you've just heard me reading about Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. Um, hello there, uh, Francis McGrath. Good to see you again. Hello, Ali Bennett. Uh, and hello to your daughter Zoe, who's listening every night too. Hi Zoe, hope you're enjoying it. Hi again, Mary Black. Uh, hi Stuart Finn, how are you? Long time no see. Hello Ray Baxter from the old BRA days, good to have you Ray. Um, hello Anne-Marie and Liz Jackson. Hi Anne Kirk, enjoying the trip down memory lane each night, I'm glad to hear it. Hello David Barr, hope you're well. Uh, hi Kenneth Glenville, hello Yitchak. Hi, um, Andy McCauley, another McCauley. Hi, good, good to see you listening again, Sadie Hannah. Susan Craig, you've listened to all nine chapters so far, um, and you think it's great, so it is. Thank you very much, <laughs> Susan. And, oh, and my, my beautiful daughter, Beth, is uh, all here. Yes, she's getting daughter points for tuning in. And hello, the amazing Larry Cowan, uh, who's going to be involved in the Paperboy movie, big time. And uh, great to have you all along. So I'm going to continue the story of... Um, of uh, being taken away from trip, away on trips, away from the troubles. My first free trip was up to Caramela. This was in Ballycastle, County Antrim, beside the sea, where you got yellow man honeycomb that stuck in your teeth and dulse that made you book on your parallel trousers in the minibus on the way home. A man with a beard had phoned Auntie Emma from the Westy Disco to ask us to come to Caramela to get away from the riots for a day. So Uncle Henry organised three free handicapped minibuses for the trip. We weren't allowed to sing the sash or smoke as they transported us up the coast to Ballycastle. En route, I noticed that the County Antrim coast had more cliffs and fewer skinheads than the County Down coast I knew so well. Caramela itself was a big white wooden house on a cliff where they liked peace and wore iron jumpers. I liked peace too because I was the only pacifist paper boy in West Belfast, but I wasn't so keen on the knitwear. They mustn't have had a John Fraser's in Ballycastle. As soon as we arrived at Caramela, the whole 30 of us spilled out of the three handicapped minibuses and jumped onto a seesaw and broke it. Auntie Emma was scundered, and the man in an iron jumper who was about to welcome us in an English accent looked quite scared. We were wilder than the waves in the sea below the cliffs. Then we played brilliant games organised by men with beards on a big field, and afterwards we got free juice and biscuits served by smiling ladies with rainbow scarves. It was the best fun ever. I loved it. Nearly everybody loved it. Peace was free. Peace was fun. Even my big brother said it was claw. Quiston with the buck teeth said it was weaker. But Titch McCracken said half the men with beards were Catholics called Brendan. And somewhat predictably, Philip Ferris said it was Ballocks. 
After we had our free juice and biscuits, we were handed out song sheets. And then one of the bearded Brendans started to play the guitar and got us to join in a sing-along on a blanket on the ground at the top of the cliff. We sang Puff the Magic Dragon, Lord of the Dance and Kumbaya. We may have been wee deprived kids from up the shankle, but when we stopped messing and started singing the same song at the same time, and when Titch McCracken stopped shouting kick the Pope between verses, we actually began to sound quite good. It was as someone singing Lord Kumbaya drifted out over the cliff edge towards Rathlin Island that Uncle Henry had his most inspired idea since introducing the breathalyzer at the door into the Westy Disco. Let's start a youth club choir, he suddenly proposed. I dead on, shouted wee Sandra Hull through her snatter tracks. Sharon Burgess smiled and nodded shyly. Heather Mateer cheered, jumping up so quickly that she split her parallel trousers and we saw her knickers and giggled inappropriately the whole way through. Someone's crying, Lord, kumbaya. Most of the girls thought the choir was a wonderful idea and squealed with excitement. The seagulls above us joined in a screeching chorus of noisy agreement. The boys were a little more restrained in our enthusiasm because boys didn't sing and my big brother said choirs were for fruits. Wysik, said my big brother. Bollocks, said Philip Ferris. Sure, give it a go, lads, requested Uncle Henry. We trusted him, so we did. We would give it a go. We spent the rest of the day talking excitedly about the new musical vistas now opening up before us. Uncle Henry was in a brilliant mood and didn't even get too angry when we left Coromila to visit the scenic harbour nearby and Titch McCracken broke into a digger and tried to drive it into the sea. We were escorted from Ballycastle by the RUC. So let's see. Who else has joined us? Hi, Neve. how are you? Hello, Mike Moran, great to have you. Hi, Nicola Coyd from Kuwait, lovely to have you along and listening to the reading. Hello, Louise. Hi, Jeff, an old BRA boy like myself. Hi, Philip Orr, good to have you, fellow author. Um, yes, you, Susan, yeah, Puff the Magic Dragon, that was, that was some song we sang back in those days. <laughs> And yeah, Nicola, I hope you do have a wee reread of the book tomorrow during, during lockdown. So I'll continue the story of now that we had established the Westy Disco Choir. Um, hi, Betty O'Reardon. I'm glad you're enjoying it. The scene was set. We were to form the first Upper Shankle Youth Club Choir. We would practice every Tuesday night after I'd done the papers and a tortuous trigonometry homework. The next time we would be taken on a free trip, it wouldn't be just as poor wee troublemakers from West Belfast. We would be travelling by invitation as a performing choir on tour. All of this meant yet more opportunities to broaden my horizons, of course. When the booking for our first international gig came in, the venue was perfect. We received an invitation to the very birthplace of roller mania itself, the land of the Mull of Kintyre. Yes, our first overseas performance was to be in Scotland, across the water on the Lawrence Dunrar Ferry. For years, we had reveled in the music that Scotland had brought to us through Woody, Eric, Alan, Leslie and Derek. Now it was our turn to return the favour. We were going to bring the music back to Scotland. Patrick Walsh at the School of Music said, all Protestants should go back to Scotland anyway. Our debut destination was Edinburgh. We were invited to sing at St Philip's Church in the city. It was a Church of Scotland church, which I thought was just Church of Ireland with a Scottish accent, but it turned out that the Church of Scotland was Presbyterian like us except with fewer flags. Presbyterians were official in Scotland, it seemed. 
we would be spending a week seeing the sights of Edinburgh and then sing at the church service on the Sunday morning before getting the boat back home. I was determined to go, so I arranged for the wee ginger boy with national health glasses that I bullied to do my paper round for the week. In a momentary lapse from my pacifist principles, I threatened to kick his teeth in if he stole any of the paper money. But in the words of our Reverend Lowe, it was, as far as I was concerned, the lesser of two evils. After months of saving, I had at last been able to buy my very own Harrington jacket complete with tartan lining, and I wore it proudly on the day of the journey to Scotland. That's queer nice new heart, and you've got wee lad, observed Irene Maxwell as we boarded the boat. Irene knew everything about fashion from Jackie magazine. The Lawrence Trenmar ferry smelt of salt and fish and book, and it made me feel very queasy. While most of my fellow choristers were enjoying a pasty supper in the canteen below decks, and some were secretly sampling vodka and coke in the bar, I ended up spending most of the voyage up on deck in the fresh air in a desperate attempt to keep down the tomato sandwiches my mommy had made for me for the journey. I tried to distract myself from the feelings of nausea by pretending I was James Bond working undercover on a cruiser in the Caribbean, wearing a white suit and trying to catch a diamond thief. But eventually, the tomato sandwiches defied gravity and returned. As the contents from my stomach spewed over the side of the Lawrence Dunrar ferry, an insulting wind from the surface of the Irish Sea blew my book back on me. My prized herring smelt rotten for weeks. Of course, my big brother happened to be passing on the deck while I was in mid-vomit and inquired sympathetically, Are you calling for Huey and you're not even in Scotland yet? When at last we arrived on dry land and travelled up to Edinburgh, I was completely awestruck. I had never seen a city like this before, apart from on Blue Peter. There was a big castle on a hill and a toy museum and huge shops where they didn't search you to get in. I kept raising my doors uh, at the entrance doors of, sorry, I started raising my arms automatically to any adult standing at the entrance doors of these shops until people looked at me strangely and I realised that you weren't searched for bombs on the way into shops over here. In Princess Street, there was a clock made of flowers and shops selling nothing but tartan. Here I found a real Macaulay tartan that you couldn't get in John Fraser's in Belfast. And I bought a strip for my mother to sew down the side of my parallels for the much anticipated Bay City Rollers concert. Most exciting of all, there were the real old-fashioned blue police telephone boxes, which, when no one was looking, I pretended were my TARDIS. Every day at one o'clock, the big cannons fired from the top of the castle. The whole youth club choir jumped in unison every time this happened because we thought it was a car bomb. We had been practising for months for this performance. The Scottish Presbyterians had heard we were very good in spite of all our sufferings, and I could sense they were looking forward to our Sunday show with great anticipation. However, as the week went by, I began to feel a little nervous. I wondered if their expectations might be a little too high. I feared they might be disappointed. I knew we could sing okay, and our performances always went down very well on Children's Day in Ballygamartin Presbyterian Church. But the youth club choir wasn't like the choir at BRA. At school, we read the musical score, and the teacher used a baton, making funny faces like a real conductor. In the youth club choir, we had no music to follow, only the words copied out on carbon paper. And Uncle Henry just waved his hands encouragingly and counted us in at the right time. At home, everyone thought we were the best choir ever because we were singing instead of fighting. But in Scotland, maybe they would have higher expectations. We had 
three pieces to perform that Sunday morning are three best ones. They were When a Child is Born, This Little Light of Mine, and Any Dream Will Do. We sang When a Child is Born all year round, and not just at Christmas, like Johnny Mathis. This was the only song we sang that had been on top of the pops, so we knew it was cool. The recital in Edinburgh began with this anthem. We started off a little nervously, but soon got into our stride. Johnny Mathis would have been proud of us. We were standing on a raised stage at the front of the church. When it came to the spoken part, and Heather Mateer said in her best American accent, the bit about turning tears into laughter, hate into love, war into peace, and everyone into each other's neighbour. I could see two old Scottish women in hats in the front row getting their hankies out. They loved us. We were a symbol of hope in a violent and cruel world. In the next song, I was to play a starring role. It was This Little Light of Mine, a fast country and western gospel song that didn't work with an organ accompaniment. So I was asked to play along on my guitar. Thankfully, my Spanish guitar had sustained no further damage on the boat journey, and so I was all set. I was nervous about the important role I had to play, but I was fairly confident too because the song had the same two chords as Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley, and I practised it to death. Mr. Ryan would have been proud of me, playing guitar up on stage in another country. I was sure that Paul McCartney's guitar teacher must have felt similar pride the first time he heard Paul performing in public. I strummed this little light of mine with all my heart and determination and the choir kept up admirably. A man at the back of the church started to clap his hands in time with the rhythm. If this had happened at home, a fat lady with a tweed berry would have turned around and shushed him. And he would have had to stop. But clapping wasn't a sin in the Church of Scotland, it seemed. It was all going very well until we came to the final verse when we cleverly adapted the lyrics to Shine all over Scotland, I'm gonna let it shine. In the excitement, I overdid it, breaking my E-string and dropping my plectrum. I had to finish using my thumb because I'd bitten all my nails for a recent chemistry exam. However, when we finished the song, the whole congregation broke out into spontaneous applause. I had never heard applause in church before. I had always thought that God didn't do clapping. Finally, it was time for our most accomplished work. Any dream will do. It was a song from a musical about Joseph with an amazing technicolour dream coat. There was even a story in the Bible based on it. Any dream will do always got us the biggest applause. The youth club choir generally didn't do four-part harmony like the school choir, but we could do quite complicated pieces like Any Dream Will Do. Where the boy sang the lines, I closed my eyes, and the girls echoed with an ah. The girls sang their ahs in a Belfast accent. No one could go up at the end of a sentence better than a Belfast girl. Our audiences usually adored this musical intricacy, so we often sang this song as our final piece and as an encore. We could feel our Scottish audience's sense of expectation grow as our finale grew near. So when Uncle Henry raised his arms and smiled, getting us ready for the opening bars of the song, there was a hushed atmosphere in the pews of St Philip's. We smiled back in silent harmony. Our smiles reflected a quiet assurance that this was going to be good. Uncle Henry counted us in, and then we were off to a harmonious start. Carried away by the music and the atmosphere, I imagined I was Joseph with a Technicolor Harrington jacket and my own pyramid in the desert because, like him, I was a dreamer too. However, disaster was just around the corner, like Owl Max Van had been the day he ran over Mrs Grant's pussy. 
No one else knew that some of the girls who normally led the ahs so beautifully had smuggled a bottle of Scottish whiskey into the girls' dormitory the night before. Nobody knew they had only managed two hours sleep. No one else knew that we were te- they were teetering in the twilight zone between still drunk and hungover. Our fate was sealed. I closed my eyes, I closed my eyes. It was lovely. Pulled back the curtain. Ah! Uncle Henry as fast as a cat in a hedge being chased by Petra. To see for certain. Ah! It was horrible. The girls began to giggle. That was bollocks, whispered Philip Ferris, much too loudly for church. The boys began to laugh. Uncle Henry wasn't laughing. The congregation wasn't laughing. Scotland was not amused. I felt my face go redder and redder. We were rude and disrespectful, we hooligans from Belfast. They had paid for us to come here and sing to them, and we had messed it up with drink as usual. It was humiliating. I vainly attempt to rescue the next ah, but it was too high for me because my voice was breaking and my big brother gave me a dig in the ribs and whispered much too loudly, shut up, freak. It was too late. We had fallen apart. Any dream will do had become a nightmare. We had travelled hundreds of miles over land and sea for this performance and we had fallen on our faces at the last hurdle. The Scottish minister rushed the benediction, bringing the awful embarrassment to a blessed end. In spite of our collapse, the Scottish Presbyterians were most forgiving. They still cried and gave us big hugs when we were leaving. It was as if we were going back to somewhere terrible, to our certain deaths. When we finally returned, another long journey which included yet another evacuation of the contents of my stomach into the Irish Sea. I was relieved and glad to be home. My new Harrington jacket was crumpled and smelly, but I was happy to be back to familiar things like homework and marbles and army Saracens and my paper round. The eventful trip to Edinburgh had whet my appetite for wider horizons, but it also confirmed to me that no matter what the rest of the world thought about us, there was something I loved about home. So there you are. That is chapter nine, Paperboy. Just want to say hello to a few other people uh, just before I go. Oh, Nicola, you're XBRA as well. Good to have you along. Alan, how are you doing? Hi, uh, hi. My wonderful P5 teacher who inspired at primary school. Lovely to have you, Ruth. Hi, Jason Blaine. Good to have you along. Uh, old colleague, Pauline. Good to have you. Hi, Linda. Um, Susan, you had a Harrington You had a Harrington with your best friend and your name's on the back. <laughs> Very good. Uh, hi, Michelle Rose. Family from the Lower Falls. You've been to many places in the world, but never up the shankle. There you go. Taking you up in... Did you ever think in these circumstances someone would be taking you up the, the shankle in a virtual world? Hi, Alan McLean. Good to have you. A lamp for Mana, Michael McKinley. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it, Michael. Nicola, Mr. Finley and his baton. That's right. Hi, Brian and Gannon. Uh, hi, Caroline. Good to, good to see you. First trip of ministry. <laughs> Been back to Edinburgh a few times since then, Caroline, haven't we? So, uh, yeah, lovely to have you all along this evening. Uh, thanks very much. Um, glad you enjoyed it, uh, Ali Bennett there. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So um, I'll be back tomorrow night for Chapter 10. But until then, uh, stay home, stay well, and stay positive. Bye for now.